Hello, I'm Surfer Clock. And I'm Tap G. And welcome to What's the Attraction? Where well, our work is your vacation. vacation. In the wise words of Brad Paisley, when you're a celebrity, it's adios, reality. Exactly how is that in any way relevant? I couldn't think of a good segue for today's episode, so here's a subpoena for my attorney at Byte and Me Associates. Okay then, let me try. <clears throat> Celebrities are awesome. You jerk, that was better. So why do we love celebrities? Do we envy their lives of fame, fortune, and sex appeal? Is it because they possess talent and gifts that we ourselves can't ever hope to equate? Or are we jealous they seem to spend more time sitting around whole private Caribbean islands and buying 20 NBA teams than being productive, menial, job-doing members of society? Or D, all of the above. And on more occasions than we'd like to admit... And on more occasions than we'd like to admit, a lot of celebrities actually do some pretty awesome things. For every Kardashian we snub our noses at and greedily read about online, there's easily three more celebrities making real, positive changes in our world. Sometimes it's through charitable works, and other times it's through sheer coolness in their performances. In theme parks, celebrities appearing as part of the rides was just about unheard of, at least on a regular basis. Although today, most roles you see or hear at Disney or Universal rides are done by voice actors, on various occasions, once in a while, a big A-lister will pop up unexpectedly and grace us with their presence. And no, we're not talking about the special concert performances or the holiday events or grand openings or franchise-specific fandom events like Harry Potter Weekend. We're talking, hey, was that Tyra Banks as an alien in that pre-show? Or, is Claire Huxtable and the guy from CSI sending us to the Cretaceous era in the most unstable and dangerous way? Or, holy cow, Michael Richards is the caveman who discovered fire? Or, Drew Carey did what now? Or, Dame Judi Dench thinks we should thank Phoenicians? Pfft, stupid Judy. For today's list, it's not just about the coolest celebrities or the funniest cameos. It's about the best celebrity appearances. These 10 actors most likely weren't there because of some contractual obligation or because they needed the money. From what we can tell, these guys didn't have to be there. They agreed to be part of the theme park attractions, more than likely because they wanted to. Today's episode is our way of saying, we realize you didn't have to be here. You could have tossed the script back at Disney and Universal and declared yourself too good for a gimmicky Easter egg when you could very well have, oh I don't know, made your appearance in franchise sequel number 17 or gone clubbing with Chris Pratt. Your wanting to be here speaks volumes. So here we go. The top 10 best celebrity appearances. Number 10. Bill Nye at Dinosaur, Disney's Animal Kingdom. As kids of the 90s, we seriously have to give props to the guy who made science a subject we'd actually want to study. You know, before Neil deGrasse Tyson and Mythbusters were a thing. Why does Bill Nye the Science Guy get our tip of the hat here instead of at Ellen's Energy Adventure at Epcot with totally likable Ellen DeGeneres? Well, two things. One, Nye has stated in an interview that he and Ellen are not the greatest of friends. Oh. Me and Ellen, I still send her holiday cards to Ellen DeGeneres. Uh, and uh, she's not my best friend in the world, but we had a good time. Second, while Ellen's Energy Adventure opened in 1996, it was right smack dab in the middle of both of their TV show runs, Ellen in 94 to 98, and Bill Nye the Science Guy in 93 to 98. There was probably something requiring them to show up wherever the mouse asked. But when Countdown to Extinction, today's Dinosaur, opened in 1998, Bill Nye's show was down to its last episodes. The queue of dinosaurs themed to look like a boring museum. It would have been easy to put a Ben Stein knockoff or maybe a Tim Curry slash Eric Idle archetype, but instead we got the energetic and accessible Bill Nye in the rotunda, excitedly talking about the dinosaurs and their untimely extinction. Today, Nye still tours around and teaches fans about science, making him one of our childhood heroes. So here's to you Bill Nye, the science guy, who taught us dinosaurs, dinosaurs are just cool! Number 9. Will Smith at Men in Black Alien Attack, Universal Studios, Florida. And speaking of the 90s, who personified them better than the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air himself? Whether he was blowing up aliens or getting jiggy with it, Will Smith of West Philadelphia, born and raised, was the 90s version of Cool Incarnate. Was there anything he wasn't cool enough for? If you said giant mechanical spider, then John Peters, you log off, you log off right now! In 1997, Smith starred as rookie MIB agent, Agent J 
a role that exemplified his smart-mouthed, hot-headed, yet totally charismatic suaveness. The surprise box office hit eventually spawned two sequels, an animated TV series, and a theme park ride. You know, like Disney, only... well, good. On the Universal ride, the only other actor reprising his role is Rip Torn as MIB leader Zed, who could have just as easily taken on the responsibility of training us new recruits, even if he's not exactly the hands-on type. Heck, some lazy show writer probably asked to have Frank the Pug do it. It would have been stupid, but it could have happened. Bottom line, Will Smith didn't have to agree to host the ride, especially when you consider, according to IMDb, as of this episode, he only has 39 acting credits. Also, Men in Black was distributed by Columbia Pictures, not Universal. It's extremely unlikely there was any contractual addendum to require him to appear in a theme park ride. But you want to know the main difference between him and Frank? What's that? He makes this look good. Number 8. Christopher Lloyd at the Simpsons ride, Universal Studios, Florida. Uh, don't you mean Back to the Future? Great Scott, Marty! You created a paradox! Oh no! How do we fix it? Remove one of the docks so we won't have a pair of them! <laughs> Did you proofread Tapford and Phineas's script? I refuse to answer that unless you admit that was funny. It was not. And I deny involvement. <clears throat> Anyway, The Simpsons Ride, because of the series' made a sense of humor, was not only able to draw from the attraction history, but also exploit it. If you're lucky enough to see the pre-show in the queue, you'll see Springfield's Professor Frank was unintentionally responsible for ruining the Institute of Future Technology and getting it paved for Krusty Land. And who does Frank confront when he alters the course of history? None other than Doc Emmett Brown, of course, voiced by Christopher Lloyd. Because it's The Simpsons, it'd actually kind of be disappointing and surprising if they didn't have him. Granted, Lloyd has spent a lot of time reliving his role as Doc Brown, A Million Ways to Die in the West, plus a few dozen commercials all come to mind. But consider this. Dan Castellaneta, the voice of Homer Simpson, played the voice of Doc Brown in the short-lived yet Emmy Award-winning animated series Back to the Future. So it's not like they had no other option. But wait... Lloyd also played Doc in the show's live-action segments, where we would also see... Bill Nye the Science Guy? Okay, now Dan Kesselanetta also voiced Aladdin's genie, who's blue, and Bill Nye's coat is blue, so that means the genie's a tune and Judge Doom's a tune, which can only mean one thing! And what might that be? Homer Simpson knocked Doc Brown off the toilet in 1955, and he came up with a flux capacitor, but Nye was jealous and created the dip to eradicate Homer and Doom so he could claim the credit on the DeLorean! <laughs> Futurama reference. Number 7. Robin Williams at the Magic of Disney Animation, Disney's Hollywood Studios slash Disney MGM Studios. Maybe we're still kind of in mourning over the loss of Robin Williams, but it's kind of fun to geek out over a pre-genie Robin at a Disney show. One that's leaps and bounds cooler than his role at The Timekeeper. From 1989 to 2004, while Magic of Disney Animation was a real studio, a pre-show called Back to Neverland featured Walter Cronkite and Mork explaining the process of animation by turning him into a lost boy in a faux Peter Pan sequel. Here, Robin's potential as a shape-shifting animated creation was realized. In fact, in the show's beginning, Robin wears a goofy hat and a yellow Hawaiian shirt, a wardrobe Genie would emulate in the finale of Aladdin. One thing to keep in mind, Robin would be higher up this list had 1989 not been a rough year for him. By the mid-80s, Robin was considered a has-been comedian, and Mork and Mindy's run ended. His few movies generated little revenue or publicity. Worse, he was going through a very messy public divorce. The only saving grace for him were the Disney-backed movies Good Morning Vietnam in 87 and Dead Poet Society in 89. So this may have just been a part of a bigger PR move to improve his public image. And too bad his relationship with Disney went south after the debacle in Aladdin. Otherwise, we might have gotten to see a lot more awesome appearances and more Disney rides today. And that's the way it is. Number 6. Mel Blanc at the Carousel of Progress, The Magic Kingdom. The realm of voice actors is a weird one. They're not as prolific as on-camera actors since they, well, they're very rarely seen on camera. They don't get paid as much, and since most of their work is featured in cartoons, there's still a tendency to look down on these actors, even though they voice many, if not nearly all, of our greatest childhood heroes. 
And if one name deserves to be lauded above all the rest, it's Mel Blanc. And if you don't know who Mel Blanc is, well... Dishonor! Dishonor on your whole family! Make a note of this! Dishonor on you! Dishonor on your cow! Dis uh, no, no, okay, that's enough, that's enough. The man has earned the title of the Man of a Thousand Voices, since he did voices of almost all the Looney Tunes. Bugs Bunny, Daffy Duck, Yosemite Sam, Tweety Bird, Sylvester, Tasmanian Devil, Foghorn Leghorn, Elmer Fudd, Porky Pig, pretty much all of them. And it may or may not surprise you that he almost never did any work for Disney, except for a few of his trademark characters in Who Framed Roger Rabbit. For Walt Disney's second movie, Pinocchio, Blank was hired to play as Honest John's clumsy, disheveled partner, Gideon. After his dialogue was recorded, it was decided to delete it all. Why? Dopey's popularity in Snow White had some believing that his mute nature was why. In an effort to repeat that success, they made Gideon mute, save for a single hiccup. That warrants a Wawa if I ever knew one. <laughs> what does any of this have to do with the Carousel of Progress? Honestly, very little. But consider that over 20 years later, Mel would return to the studio to provide a few voices on the carousel. Who does he play? Well, there's... There's a great big beautiful tomorrow. <laughs> she keeps that thing going all day long. <laughs> Progress. <laughs> well, yeah, there's that. Uh, but there's also... Well, that. No privacy at all around this place. Sorry, Orville. Number 5. Morgan Freeman at the Hall of Presidents Magic Kingdom Park. The Hall of Presidents has often featured prominent narrators like Maya Angelou or Lawrence Dobkin. In 2008, when Barack Obama was elected president, a new narrator was needed. At the time, a black man becoming commander-in-chief was a big, revolutionary deal. So most likely Disney opted for the guy from Shawshank Redemption who people still kept mistaking for Nelson Mandela. What's surprising is Freeman endorsed Obama's campaign, but so did many other Hollywood stars back then. And if it was purely a race thing, he most likely would have turned them down, since the man who says the only way to end racism is to stop talking about it. Say what you will about the political or racial aspects, but he still did it. And besides, what are you gonna do? Hate on Morgan Freeman? Yeah, let us know how that goes. Number four, Gary Sinise at Mission Space, Epcot. Sure, we all know Sinise as the cantankerous Lieutenant Dan from Forrest Gump, or as Mac from CSI New York. Heck, he even does those army commercials with his effectively commanding narration. But he's also known as an astronaut in his movies, like Apollo 13, and the oft-forgotten Mission to Mars in 2000, a movie sort of based on the old Disneyland and Walt Disney World attraction. But the connection between the ride and the old show is pretty scant. And ironically, the correlation between the movie and the new ride, Mission Space, is actually even less than that. But let's be honest, if Lieutenant Dan gives you orders as you're doing a slingshot orbit around the moon, you listen. And yes, he also comes virtually every year to read the Christmas story at Epcot's Candlelight Processional. So if you ever want to see him live, there it is. Of course, Sinise's appearance is all the more awesome when you consider Sinise also plays the bass in a band called, are you ready for this? The Lieutenant Dan Band. Aww. So yeah, Gary Sinise, Army Strong, Astronaut Strong, and remember, don't move a muscle. When you're a Number three, Martin Short. Martin Short where? Give me a sec. Martin Short isn't exactly an A-list celebrity, but you may remember him from SCTV, where he won an Emmy, or the times he worked with Steve Martin in The Three Amigos, Father of the Bride, and Prince of Egypt. He's done a lot of great work and is still working to this day, but he's on this list because he appears in not one, not two, not three, but four different Disney attractions, beating Bill Nye's record of three, and excluding voice actors like Corey Burton and Jim Cummings. Wait, I thought Bill did too. I forgot Disney Quest Cyberspace Mountain. When Disney MGM Studios opened in May of 1989, Martin Short and co-amigo Chevy Chase starred in the Monster Sound Show, where guests could coordinate sound effects with the on-screen show. The show closed in 1997 to make way for Disney's Doug Live. In October of 1989, Disney opened the Wonders of Life Pavilion at Epcot to showcase healthy lifestyle living like Body Wars, Cranium Command, and Goofy About Health. Oh, and a show about how babies are born. Look out for Mr. Stark. 
A persevering chap. No, no, no storks, no birds and bees, just the straight up truth. And if you don't believe me, find the show called The Making of Me. It ran until 2007, where the pavilion shut down for events like Flower and Garden and Food and Wine. Short is also a native of Ontario, Canada. In 2007, the original O Canada show was starting to show its age, and was replaced by its current incarnation a few months later. So to this day, Martin Short can only be seen at the O Canada show at Epcot. So that's one, two, three, three things at Disney World that he's done. Wait, what's the fourth one? It's not in Disney World. It's actually in Walt Disney Studios Park in Disneyland Paris. It's called Cinema Magique, all about the history of cinema. It still runs to this day. So if you appear in four different Disney shows, it really doesn't matter who you are. That's pretty awesome. Number two, Christopher Walken at Disaster, a major motion picture starring you, Universal Studios Florida. Because Christopher Walken. Boy, is this guy one unusual entity. He's made a career out of pretending as though he were an alien still getting used to acting human. Though granted, there isn't sufficient evidence to say he isn't, though it might explain him being in Country Bears. Walken has made a career out of being bizarre and awkward. And like Morgan Freeman, Walken hasn't done projects for Universal that tie into this attraction. So it begs the question, why is he here? But I think the better question is, does it really matter why? In this ride, he plays Frank Kincaid, a slightly crazy director of a new movie called Mother Nature. Thanks to a really cool special effect, Walken interacts with a Universal cast member, Lonnie, as they select extras for his new blockbuster picture. That would be us, the guests. When all is said and done, you get to see the trailer from Mother Nature, uh, starring a surprising cameo from Dwayne The Rock Johnson in what can best be described as the test video he made for his audition for San Andreas. Sorry, Rock, you're cool, but... Christopher Walken, dude! More cowbell! And he's only number two! This list is not over! Bears! And the number one best celebrity appearance is... Johnny, Johnny Depp as Captain, Captain Jack Sparrow. Sparrow! We're all too familiar with actors who despise their most iconic roles, like Sean Connery with James Bond, Christopher Plummer with The Sound of Music, Robert Pattinson, and Twilight. Uh, but most actors have at least a fondness for their roles. Johnny Depp really, really loves his role as Jack Sparrow. Like most actors, Depp doesn't play Jack every single time. In Kingdom Hearts 2, Jack is voiced by James Arnold Taylor. But those dulcet tones you hear in the treasure room finale of Pirates of the Caribbean at Magic Kingdom? That's Depp. The off-maligned Legend of Jack Sparrow show at Hollywood Studios? Depp donned the gear just for that, too. So what, you say? How is that any different from Tom Hanks' Woody for Anything Toy Story, or Nathan Lane as Timon for The Lion King, or Anthony Daniels doing C-3PO? What's the big deal? Well, here's the thing. Depp, like a lot of other celebrities, visits the Disney theme parks, and on occasion, he hides in the most conspicuously inconspicuous place possible during Mickey's not-so-scary Halloween party. As Jack Sparrow on the Pirates float for the Boo to You parade. Fans? What can we say? That's off the awesome charts. That's dedication, fan service, and passion like no other. Celebrities frequent Universal and Disney, but as far as we know, only Johnny Depp honors guests once in a while while showing up as Jack. And it's because of all this that Johnny Depp is the number one best celebrity appearance at the theme parks. Savvy. So, uh, what do you fans think? Do we do right by your famous celebrities? Or should we have picked a few more? Send us a comment or two to let us know what you think. And please, play nice. So, until next time, I'm Surfer Clock. And we're off to Hollywood. And we're What's the Attraction? Where our work is your vacation. Consider this our celebrity endorsement.